Pretty clock. Pretty clock. Yeah. Whose clock is it? Oh. Getting all my screens here. Hold on one second. I can't see everybody. Oh, there we go. Okay. Hey, by the end of this class, I will have this set. <laughs> I will know exactly what I'm doing. All right. Okay. So we're going to look at a different book today. Um, Salty Wives, Spirited Mothers, and Savvy Widows. I love the title. Okay. And our story today is Mary and Elizabeth. And I, I didn't put all of it on the slides because it, it's very long. So I went through and kind of put together what I thought would make sense. So hopefully it does. <clears throat> so what are the important qualities in a friendship to you? Uh, mutuality. Okay, sounds good. Trust. trust. Tr yeah, trust. trust. Yeah. Respect. And Janet, by mutuality, you mean? I mean that it's not all one way, that, that there's give and take on both sides. Okay. I think affection, too. Affection, okay. A good listener. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Those are the biggies, right? And the opposite, willing to listen. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay, so here's the backstory that I didn't include. Um, this story starts with Elizabeth, Elizabeth's husband, Zachariah, a priest. He was visited by the angel Gabriel and told that Elizabeth would become pregnant. And Elizabeth is beyond childbearing years so Zachariah doubted that this would happen. So that's where we start. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and for five months, she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me. When he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. So before we get into it too much, why do you think she was in seclusion for five months? Um, that really puzzles me because she wouldn't have been considered unclean. Yeah, I don't think it has to do with purity. Maybe she was embarrassed. Maybe she was embarrassed because, you know, she's getting up in years, right? <laughs> you know, sometimes women don't want to, like, if they're not sure. Um, I know women who've had a couple of miscarriages and then on the next baby, they just don't tell anybody for a long time. Uh, they're like, it's hoping against hope. So maybe a little of that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe she had morning sickness, but <laughs> just didn't feel well. <laughs> yeah. Could have been the doctor said, hey, you got to take it easy because you are up yeah. there. So yeah. Know, yeah. Risk, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some interesting things to think about. Um, and then she says, um, she, he took, God took away the disgrace. What do you think that means? Any idea? I think probably in that society, if a woman didn't have children, she'd failed. And we still Absolutely. have some of that. Absolutely. Yeah. It was actually, it was humiliating. It was shameful. It was even possible grounds for divorce. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other thoughts? The angel said, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear us out. Sorry, we are, we are to marry now. <laughs> I skipped it. <laughs> so, you know, okay. Um, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. 
and the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Which gospel are we in? We are in Luke, which is the only one that starts out with this, um, they call it the infant narrative, where um, Mary and Elizabeth are both well, visited by the angel. I guess Zechariah is technically the one who's visited by the angel, but yeah, they're both yeah. pregnant at the same time. Okay. Um, Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. So something that I missed, actually probably every time that I've read this story, is that the angel told Mary about Elizabeth. So why do you think that the angel did that? It seems to be an announcement that God has great power and that many things can happen. Yeah. Verifying the power. Yeah. Sounds good. Anything else? Well, and just, uh, just to jump on what Janet said, too, um, and that would be reassuring to her. It's like, okay, God, you know, because, I mean, what he just told her he was going to do with her had to be mind-boggling. And right. so, you know, um, yeah. miracles here. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's kind of establishing a little bit of trust there, right? Yeah. Yeah. So and we don't we don't know anything about Mary's family. Like, did she have a mother Maybe um, Elizabeth would be old enough maybe to be her mother, you know, <laughs> age-wise. So, you know, maybe it was just a suggestion that Elizabeth could be her mentor and her mother. Right, yeah, because she's going through the same thing, right? We don't, yeah, we, I mean, we don't know um, mm -hmm. the rest of that. Right, right, yeah. And I think it is important that it's someone that Mary knows, so it's... It's right. more helping that trust that it's going to happen because you can see it happen. Yeah. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. So it's interesting that it says, went with haste. Why do you think she went with haste? She's pregnant now. <laughs> it's not she's like excited. a short pregnant, right? Yeah, she's excited. That's that could be. I mean, she goes a long way, I think, and she's either walking or on a, a horse or a donkey, right? So, I would go with excitement. Yeah, I think that explains it. Yeah, that could be. Or advice, maybe advice. Maybe advice. A little bit of fear, baby. Is this Here. real? Is it real? Okay. Yeah. It may also be because she's hiding the pregnancy because she's like, okay, I don't think I want to deal with all the questions yet because this is, this is a little bit weird, right? <laughs> um, my, my betrothed is not my child's father. You know, this is, this is weird. So maybe she needed to do that and get away for a while. Other thoughts? Okay. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? 
For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. What does anything stand out to you in this part? Well, the story doesn't tell us whether Mary had already filled her in on all of the details. So there's some possibility that we're seeing her um, have some kind of special knowledge of what had happened. Right. Yeah. Other thoughts? This is actually, um, it's both Elizabeth and baby John know that Jesus is the Messiah. And John and Jesus only meet unborn in Luke. They never actually meet, hmm. you know, in person. I was surprised at that. Um, hmm. And Christ's identity is first announced in Luke in a woman's voice, which is very significant. Hmm. And then the Magnificat, which most people know. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and is holy and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. So what is Mary feeling right now? <clears throat> Excuse me. Or did you have a different comment, Janet? No, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyway, anyway, what what is Mary feeling right now? Do you think? I think she's. Um, I think the Magnificat reflects her understanding of what the Jewish faith is all about, and uh, it's, it's very consistent with her heritage. It's interesting that it's in Luke because Luke was written for Gentile Christians. And here's this very Jewish statement about what God's like. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of Holden even evening prayer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Very much. <laughs> I'm waiting for Gretchen to start singing. <laughs> right. We could probably all sing it. Yeah. <laughs> right. I think we've all got it memorized. <laughs> um, the uh, there's a medieval Chris, Christmas hymn that is the Magnificat, and it uh, it refers to and God will cast down the proud, and it's it's interesting to me because that's it's such a revolutionary. Um, and the Magnificat is a revolutionary piece of work. Yeah. Is that, you said it was Christmas one? Yes. Okay. I'm trying to remember what the actual name of the piece is, but all I can hear is the, the chorus. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> oh, Masters in this Hall. Oh, okay. All right. So, Something that's interesting about this book that we are reading, The Salty Wives, whatever it was called, um, the author presents something called Household Rivals. And I'll go into that in a, in a minute. I want to read this quote from later in Luke. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, 
Oops. I don't know what that word was supposed to be. From now on, no one in the one house will be divided. Three against two. Oh, five. Okay, I see. Sorry. From now on, five in one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So in this book, he points out a biblical plot pattern that he calls the household rivals type scene. This pattern is seen in many of the relationships in the Bible. Sarah and Hagar, Leah and Rachel, Elizabeth and Mary, Mary and Martha, just to name a few. It is adjusted based on the needs of the narrative at hand. In the Old Testament, a lot of times, one of the women wins and sometimes results in a life-death situation. <clears throat> if you think about Hagar, who was out in the desert, thinking that her child was going to die, but then was sent back to Sarah's household. Okay, so in this scenario, a pair of women shared a domicile, a house, different social positions. They have distinctive gifts and interests. They're compared to the other woman. It involves matters of hospitality, triangular relations with the male authority, confession of faith in the divine. The divine makes a judgment on the rivalry between, from equality to separation. So in this story, a pair of women share a domicile. So Mary comes to visit Elizabeth after Mary is pregnant Mary is Elizabeth's either niece or cousin. They're not really sure which one. They have different social positions. Elizabeth is elderly and barren, wife of a Judean priest. Mary is a young virgin, again engaged to a poor Galilean, but from the line of David. They have distinctive gifts. Elizabeth is wife of a priest isn't described as the typical barren woman in the Bible who is bitter. So she says, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorable on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. So it sounds like she's not blaming God, but she is rejoicing in the moment. So she's not looking back going, you, you deny me children all this time. She's looking forward. So compared to the other woman, so Elizabeth's son, John the Baptist, will be great in the sight of the Lord and the prophet of the Most High. Mary's son, Jesus, will be great and he will be called the son of the Most High and the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. So this is when the rival usually starts, is when you start comparing, and then you see, okay, well, Mary's son is supposed to be more important than Elizabeth's son, so now they're going to go at it, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's the typical pattern. Um, there's a confession of faith in the divine, for he has looked with favor on the loneliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And the divine makes a judgment. Mary returns home before John is born, and Elizabeth isn't present at Jesus' birth. So each has their moment in the spotlight, not diminishing either one. So let's think about what messages society has given teenage mothers over the years because that's what Mary was. She was a teenage mother and unmarried at the time. Bad girl. Yeah. <laughs> well, and over the years, the bad part was not being married because uh, yeah. I think, you know, women did uh, marry younger and there were teenage right. mothers. But yeah, my, my grandmother was 17 when she had my dad. So. Yeah, yeah, but but the being married part was was right, right, 
right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we don't tend to think that this is going to be a successful thing, right? We're like, you know, right. this, this is a hard life. How are you going to live? Yeah. Support your baby, you know, how are you going to take care of your baby? All this stuff, right? Well, and in modern society, it's really, um, I think, um, you know, the, the, the bad part, the bad feeling has gone towards the whole thing of teenage, you know, health issues, social issues, and all of those kind of things, whether they're married or not. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, too young to have a kid, too young to be able to provide or parent that child. Mm -hmm. Right. But what was the, what was the, <clears throat> average lifespan back then 2000 yeah. years ago uh, you know <laughs> I, I, well, I don't know yeah. a lot of people yeah. a lot of people died young but if you lived to be 30 then you were likely to live to be 60 oh it's mm. be it's because of the the death of babies and children probably yeah. i mean that yeah. cuts down on the yeah i know in medieval society it was uh 30 was considered middle-aged and if you got to 50 you were an old person mm -hmm. but i don't know about yeah yeah that sounds about right I, th I think different cultures look upon a uh, teenage pregnancy differently i know in texas uh there were Hispanic families where the teenager would tell me, well, my mother or grandmother tells me if I go ahead and get pregnant, then I'll be, she'd be happy to take care of the child for me. And we had um, mothers who kind of collected all the unwed teenagers. And I know in the book we're reading for the book club, uh, Murmur of the Bees, um, they were deciding that a, a 16 year old might as well go ahead and get married because war was coming. If you didn't grab the opportunity for love, then it might not be any future. But I think among the uh, middle class Anglos, the teenage uh, pregnant children would be sent off to a, a convent or a place to hide out and pretend that they were visiting grandma rather than uh, went off to have their baby and give it up for adoption. Mm -hmm. But now there's high schools that have daycare. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So, Absolutely. And parenting classes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is a good thing. Well, Beaverton School District for at least 30 years has had, um, and it had, it's an acronym, I can't, but it's, you know, parents of young children, you know, and the girls have classes while daycare is provided. Yeah. And they finish their high school degrees and, um, yeah, so that helps them. I know our church in Austin was kind of a daycare center for the children of the unwed mothers who were attending high school across the street. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like we have hopefully adjusted in our society a little bit to accommodate what's been going on. A little. Yeah. A little. I <laughs> but I think there's still some messages out there that it's like, oh, no, that's not good. So, you know. And I, I, I remember back in North Dakota when young people got married and there was always that. And then the short, not not nine months after they've gotten married, they have a child and people are saying, oh, see, they got married here. And they all, oh, it's only six months, you know. <laughs> and that, was, that was very common. That was, uh, and we didn't do anything about it except gossip about it. But, um, I think it's interesting when they talk about the... Uh, black young men that have been killed by the police that they always emphasize that they were fathers and left an, a child behind and i was thinking is that a good or a bad thing that this unmarried father young and with a criminal history is more to be pitied because he has a child maybe the child is more maybe that's what they're after i don't know yeah, yeah, who's going to take care of, but what were they taking care of the baby in the first place? I know. <laughs> okay. Plus, they tend to have extended families, like the grandmother yeah. around. So it's a different semi-culture. And I was just thinking that maybe, um, maybe 
back in 2000 years ago, maybe the idea of having a child, um, well, the extended family would be really important in raising children um, back then as well. I know I'm, I'm working on a biography of my grandparents and they, they lived in this conclave with all of their extended family and the kids were at all of the houses all the time. So, I mean, you know, even a hundred years ago that was happening um, at least in central Illinois culture. <laughs> well, it does take a village. So. Yeah. yeah, and and and, the, and, it, and it was a definite village. I mean, the kids would stop at their aunts after school every day. They went to school across the street. So, you yeah. know, I think that, that that concept of extended family might have been a very important concept back then as well. Mm -hmm. It was, yeah. Probably. In those days, Harry set out and went with haste to the Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zachariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth's, why am I doing this? I don't oh. have notes here. I don't know what that was. Oh, I think, yeah, I'm not sure why I put those back there. Oh, I know why. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I was trying to show that Elizabeth Upon here, upon being greeting Mary, was very supportive of her. So it was different than a lot of times we would expect it to be. That was my point. Well, <laughs> one, thing, one thing I just looked up: the distance between uh, Nazareth and Bethlehem. It doesn't say what town; it just says a Judean town. Uh, One hundred and fifty-six kilometers. Yeah. It That's, wasn't a short trip. It wasn't a really <laughs> short trip, especially on a donkey. But uh, yeah. <laughs> right. And then, then, so, then uh, she was three months pregnant. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what qualities do you see in the friendship of Mary and Elizabeth? How do they treat each other? Well, the willingness to travel that distance shows mm -hmm. itself that they're good mm -hmm. friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely love and affection. You can just feel it through the words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, de a, a real depth and respect. If she stayed that many months with her, that must have been something really positive going on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Must have been hard on Joseph, though. Huh? <laughs> yeah, what was he doing during this time? <laughs> well, and, and I was just thinking that she had to travel back home very pregnant. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> on a donkey. Yikes. Yeah. 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 L luckily, God was, you know, overall <laughs> checking <laughs> and keeping yeah. things on board. <laughs> yeah. Do you see trust in the relationship? Oh, yeah. Definitely. I think so, yeah. So would, would Elizabeth have been the first one that Mary shared this with? Do we know? We don't know. And, so, and, I, and as far as timing, I have a question. When did Joseph, you know, in the midst of this trip, decide, oh, my gosh, I better just quietly you know, divorce her or whatever, or whatever you do with your betrothed, you and, know, um, okay, go ahead. yeah, I just wondered, was that, was that while, while she was with Elizabeth, that he figured this out, and the angel came to him? I don't know if I'm mixing stories, but what I remember is that Joseph, yeah, I am mixing stories, because that was the other gospel, <laughs> the other gospel was the one that said, that Joseph was the one who was visited by the angel. And so he knew that it was the spirit and not some other man. Yeah. And I was just wondering if that happened while she was with Elizabeth and then she came back and it was like Joseph had figured it out by then. Well, yeah, because it's two different stories. It's yeah. possible yeah. 
gospel of Luke versus gospel yeah. of love. Yeah. I mm-hmm. don't remember Mark. <laughs> It's either Mark or Matthew. That question comes under the category of harmonizing the Gospels. And many people have tried over the years to harmonize the Gospels. And it's a real open question whether we should try to do that or we should just say they're two different stories and they weren't meant to be harmonized. Yeah, thank you, Janet. That helps, but but I, I can't help it though, right? I think we you know we just we want to get it all <laughs> in in proper order. <laughs> when just Harvey talk. when Harvey Blomberg, our former pastor, was here, he said the Bible is more like a library, which means the book, <laughs> yeah. books don't necessarily have to tie to each other, right. <laughs> or a newspaper. Yeah, yeah. different yeah. articles. <laughs> yeah, different points of view too. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. the same story. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There, there were two Bethlehems. There was a Bethlehem in Galilee. Yeah. Huh. They were very far apart, actually. That's what I remember. Yeah. So they're not really sure which one it was, but yeah. Okay. It wouldn't have been as hard to go to that one. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I don't remember exactly where they are, so yeah. Right. Okay. Any other thoughts about their friendship? I do have another question. Do we have any, did they ever, did Mary and Elizabeth ever see each other again? No. Okay. According to the story. Yeah. It was just, yeah, actually that's in my notes here somewhere, I think. But yeah, they, they just went their separate ways. And that was it. Yeah. So um, let's see what other thoughts did I have. Okay, so this is, they relate to each other as equals, I would think. Would you agree or disagree? Looks like it. Yeah. Okay. Pretty close. I think, you know, Elizabeth was older, so she'd have some, but they were both kind of in the same boat. Right. Yeah. So one of the things that happens with this story of the household rivals is that a lot of times in the Old Testament, there's an older sibling or a younger sibling, and they're at each other, and there's like a hierarchy. So like Cain and Abel, where Cain is the older brother, Abel's the younger, but then Abel is the one who has the offering that pleases God more, and then Cain kills him, right? (laughs) Just... Wow, these stories, huh? (laughs) And Lena and Rachel with the sisters that are married to Jacob. And Rachel is the the favorite, but she's the younger. You know, I mean, all of this tension that's going on. And yet, in this relationship, that tension is not there. Um, They seem to be happy for each other. And even when Elizabeth acknowledges that Mary's baby is Jesus, and therefore, you know, more important than her son, Mary is humble. She doesn't say, well, man, 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 you know, (laughs) I'm better than you or anything. Um, So that's definitely a a difference. Um, And they're able to find common ground through their intergenerational relationship. Okay, so this is an interesting just comment, I guess, (laughs) that Luke is the only gospel to talk about women disciples. And this happens in Luke 8. Soon afterwards, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, and as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had had gone out, and Joanna, Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. So we see that the men and the women are with Jesus. They're traveling with him. Um, the women have, they're actually mentioned as being healed by Jesus. They had resources. They weren't identified by their husbands, many of them. The only one that I see is Joanna. So that's interesting. 
um, and they exemplify discipleship in Luke. Um, I think that's all I had for today. You know, early you, you talked about how important it is if, if somebody is named. And so it's interesting that these, um, these women are named here. Yes, absolutely. But do you suppose that you had to have been cured of evil spirits and infirmities if you were a woman following Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's how they were, how they initially came to him. I don't know, because he wasn't. Yeah, he yeah. wasn't one that would actually go out and try to get the women to him. At least that's not what the stories seem to say. Yeah. But, you know, maybe that's how they came in. <laughs> Just a theory. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I was thinking along the same lines as, as Bev, uh, you know. <laughs> Did you have to be sick first? And did, if you're a woman, yeah. yeah. Weak, weak. You had to be weak. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I do have one more slide. Um, and it was an interesting thing to look at was in class, we, we took just looking at one of the Gospels, and we were looking at where the gender is not specified. So crowds, onlookers, disciples, and places where it would make sense for women to be present. And if you look at it that way and you read it that way, you may realize that you've read it and hadn't really thought about that women would be present there. Uh, that's how I, I realized that I wasn't putting them there. And so it made me wonder why I wasn't. So, yeah. I think it's interesting that in the story of of Mary conceiving and Elizabeth conceiving, we aren't told that those two women were especially beautiful or especially sexually alluring. Um, we aren't told, you know, Mary was a athletic, slender, beautiful <laughs> young woman. Um, what we're told is that she was especially faithful to God, and I think that is uh, helpful in the culture we're living in now, which idolizes youth and beauty and can help us realize that uh, God's big concern is not our being beautiful. And maybe this is a story that welcomes unwed mothers as well, like saying, you know what, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, that's all I had. So if you want to, uh, let's see, leave breakout room, you may, or you can stay and chat, whichever. Who's next week? Do you know yet? Um, I think it's going to be the woman accused of adultery. Ooh. Unless it goes horribly wrong in class. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't usually, so. <laughs> but, yeah, that's the point. That's from uh, the Gospel of John. And then I'm not sure about the last week. I was thinking resurrection women, but, you know, we'll see how that goes as well. So I, I love the way this is just evolving. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. You're welcome. I'm glad. Yeah. This yeah. Is fun. Lots of fresh ways to think in this class. Mm -hmm. I've, I've appreciated that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just like to throw something out to everybody that um, a, a lot of artwork has to do with, uh, you know, where the, the classical painters, you know, will have Jesus and John, two little boys, you know, and John often has, is he handing Jesus a, an arrow or something? I can't mm -hmm. remember. There's one at, at, down at Portland, Portland Art Museum that's just beautiful. And then I think there is artwork that shows, you know, that shows Mary and Elizabeth together too. Anyway, it seemed to be a very popular painting, a uh, subject of painting in, in many for many painters in the Renaissance, I guess. And uh, Mary's usually painted in blue, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I can't remember why. Does anybody remember why? <laughs> no. Yeah, I don't know why. But I just remember I took a I took a walking tour at Portland Art Museum, and the docent said, "Okay, now you can tell that's Mary because she's got a blue veil." <laughs> so <Yeah>. that's <laughs> how I learned it. Well, 
blue blue was expensive for one thing they made it by actually grinding up lapis lazuli which is a nice stone mm -hmm. and it there was a started out mary was in pink oh. let me see how does that work um okay let me let me think uh, it's that pink blue thing between boys and girls. And the Catholics, I think, had Mary in blue, so the Protestants put her in pink. Really? They reversed it, and Joseph was in red, pink, and uh, the Protestants left. Or I mean, he was in. Let's see, if Mary was pink, Joseph was blue, and then vice you know, vice versa. And it was, there was a period of time, right, um, right at the Reformation, where you didn't want anything to look Catholic, so you did the opposite. <laughs> and that's, that's where we started getting landscape drawings. It was, you couldn't draw uh, anything the Catholics were using, they wouldn't, they wouldn't use. So they draw a picture of a tree that sort of looked like a cross, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, there was a, a great uh, printmaker that did that, made that pretty popular. That's a, then it's from there they started doing landscape things that incorporated cross beams, you know, like a windmill or something like that. But the <laughs> colors, the colors of Mary in blue and Joseph in a red robe, pretty sure that those are Protestant. <laughs> We let's see, or as Catholic, and we put <laughs> girls and boys in pink and blue. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm I'm sorry. I shouldn't. Have, I should have thought that through a little better before I opened my mouth. But um, no worries. It, it has to do with the Catholic Protestant thing, mm. and it also in honoring Mary is the fact they were using um, an expensive color plus surrounding them with gold um you know gold leaf and uh, this was this is the renaissance this is hundreds of years later um, but, uh, i think if i remember correctly pink was considered a faded red so it was yeah not, yeah huh. yeah well it so was a faded red probably they had a hard time yeah getting ready Speaking of colors, I don't know, if, I think I already maybe said this. I watched a show and they, they were looking for how the dye was made that make those little, um, that, that make the, the stripes on the, on the, um, uh, can't think of the name of the, sh the garment that the Jews wear, you know, the, the shawl thing with the stripes at the end. Oh, yeah. And they couldn't, they lost when the, when the temple was destroyed, there was all the destruction and between 70 and 100. Um, why the, um, they lost how to make that dye. So this was research recently that was trying, one, one school of thought was it was with um, cuttlefish and the other school of thought was it was snails that they used and they, um, did of course tried it and the cuttlefish you get you get purple and with the snails you got purple and that was their sticking point they could not get blue and they they uh, smashed up they, they found they found a lot of snail shells so there was thinking that it was probably snails sea snails and they were um, you smash up a lot of snails to get a a pulp and. Anyway, this is the source of your dye, and it's really, really terribly stinky. It's horrible. <laughs> uh, so, so it says in um, I don't know if it's Deuteronomy, one of them that if a man becomes a dyer after he's married, the woman can divorce him. <laughs> it, it's so because he smells so life. bad. <laughs> it smells so bad, yeah. Anyway, these researchers found just accidentally <laughs> took some fabric outside and it turned blue. Oh. So the ultraviolet light of the sun 
reacted on this purple and made it blue. Yeah. So they, they think they have the answer in that, which is, it was supposed to trigger the end of time. <laughs> they found the, how to make the dye again. So I don't know. <laughs> that was a good thing or not. But, but it was interesting that there was that comment on divorce as well. Um, back in the old days. <laughs> so the liturgical color for Advent is blue. Do you suppose that that reflects again that earl those early preferences of painting mary in blue is that where that where the blue comes from i mean i don't know where any of the liturgical colors come from but that might be a good thing to wonder yeah. about yeah yeah well she was called queen of heaven royal colors were the ones that were hard for them to get red purple blue in fact in the Middle Ages, there was a code. You could only wear certain colors depending on your station and your job. So not, it was special. It was special for Mary. Well, red is Koshniel. It's a beetle. <clears throat> right. That's where the 